Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Emma. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we are so thrilled to be hosting this afternoon's talk. Um, the first thing I want to do is list off the next couple events for adults that are coming up here at the library. Um, next Thursday on the 20th in the reading room, we're going to be doing a concert with our own Peter Proler at six o'clock and he'll be hosting uh, Travels with Banjo, stories and songs talking about his uh, life traveling the US and playing banjo and, and it should be a really fun time. Um, we're also doing the next Wednesday on the 26th at two o'clock, we're doing a Thompson Meadow Road cleanup with Jesse and Patty. who will be doing a walk around the road and, and providing trash bags and things to uh, just sort of celebrate your thing, clean up the environment a little bit. The next Thursday on the 27th at 6.30, we're also doing a reading room event, uh, a Poetry Rocks concert with Dave Morrison, uh, who is a local poet and a great friend of ours to celebrate uh, the 15th anniversary of his work Sliver and also to celebrate National Poetry Month. Um, so that's on the 27th at 6.30. Uh, I think that that's it from me for upcoming events in terms of the Q&A portion of tonight's talk, today's talk, not tonight, it's two o'clock. Um, for those of us joining on Zoom, if you'd like to keep your camera and microphone muted throughout the talk and just type your questions into the chat and I can read them aloud for Nathan here. And then for those of us joining in Zoom, if you like to project, you can project or I can also use this handheld microphone to bring it over to you and make sure that everyone can hear your question. I think that's it for me, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Nathan Lippert is Curator Emeritus at the Maine Maritime Museum in Bath, where he worked from 1971 to 2017 in various curatorial capacities. He studied at Hofstra University and Vermont College of Norwalk University and the National Archives Institute. A nautical and maritime historian, he has written extensively on the subject, and he lives in Woolworth, Maine. And I'm happy to turn it right over to Nathan. Thank you, Em. So, the shipbuilding industry is a source of immense pride uh, to Mainers, uh, and there's a lot to be proud of. Time and again, the largest ship then in the world, the first or last vessel of a particular rig or engine, the only fleet of some type, a naval vessel caught up in some world-changing event, a winning racer, or some spectacular yacht turns out to have been built in this state. And main yards were more productive than those of other states. For most of the 19th century, as long as wooden ships uh, and to some degree sailing ships were the state of the art, main shipyards built more vessels and more tons of vessels than any other state. The city of Bath identifies so strongly with the industry that the high school sports teams are called the shipbuilders. I'm going to be talking about uh, about shipbuilding as opposed to boat building uh, today, but I, I want to make, pay homage uh, to uh, the brilliant small craft designs of the seafaring native peoples of Maine. Uh, over 4,000 years ago, they were going offshore in big dugout canoes uh, to hunt swordfish. Um, and uh, the, the light birch bark canoes that they developed later were ideal for river and lake travel, as well as for trips along the coast. Uh, and they were used by Wabanaki people for hunting sea creatures as large as porpoises. Um, and their construction was made easier by the development of the crooked knife that you can see up there. Um, and of course, the canoe was widely adopted by uh, European colonists and continues in use today. <clears throat> The first ocean-going vessel built in Maine, uh, as, as most of you may have heard, uh, was the 30-ton pinnace Virginia, built at Popham in Phippsburg by the Popham colonists in 1607-1608. Uh, and a cocking iron that you see in the lower right there, uh, found by archaeologists, uh, was probably certainly used in its construction. Uh, there's no guarantee what the pinnace actually looked like. It may have looked like the, the little sketch there in this uh, contemporary map of the colony. Um, a reproduction uh, has been built in Bath, uh, um, launched last summer, 
uh, currently in winter storage still in, in Wiscasset. Uh, you can see it when you drive across the bridge there. Um, but, uh, and so we're looking for interesting things to happen with that. Maine built numbers of vessels out of all proportion uh, to its population and economic stature. There are three important reasons for this. Uh, and this is the thing that people always ask, and I hope you all take away from this, uh, from this talk, three reasons, topography, geography, and a skilled workforce. Topography uh, refers to the fact that Maine simply has more coastline than most other states. And people call us a, call it a rock-bound coast. Uh, but in fact, a lot of it is suitable for shipbuilding, which is uh, suitable means uh, gently sloping solid land uh, next to deep water. Geography uh, refers to the main forests, uh, which originally contained both hardwood and softwood trees suitable for shipbuilding, for making frames and planking and masts and other spars. Uh, and we also had great rivers for bringing the timber uh, from inland forests down to coastal shipyards. And then the third thing is the the skilled workforce. Um, ships have always been among the most complex things built by humans. And Maine developed a critical mass of shipbuilding skill as a result of having the topography and the geography uh, that, that was ideal for the situation. Most vessels in the 19th century uh, and somewhat earlier were designed by use of a half model. And these things have uh, survived, uh, you know, in uh, surprisingly, these things have survived more than any image of these vessels, the earliest vessels. These are the earliest two uh, half models that I have found. Uh, one of the, the, the little 90-foot full rig ship North Star uh, built at Bath in, in 1810. That one is at the Maine Maritime Museum. Uh, and then the, the uh, topsail schooner Dash uh, built in 1812 that later became a privateer during the War of 1812. Uh, that's at the Freeport Historical Society. The first picture that shows us uh, a main shipyard and a vessel being launched from the yard is this one. This is the ship of the line, Washington, launching from the first ship house at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. Uh, it's an 1814 event uh, and a painting sometime afterwards uh, by somebody who was believed to have attended the event. Um, the first launch of a new vessel at the, at the Navy Yard. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's, uh, let's see. Things. No, it's not showing that. All right. Um, it's this, this is the, the ship house is here. Uh, this is the stern. Of the of the ship of the line sliding out of the ship house. This is a, a frigate that was there at the same time. From 1814, 18, yeah, 1814, uh, we skipped to 1856 to find the next image uh, of a vessel. Uh, in a main shipyard. And that is this image of the ship Hez Williams uh, in 1856 at the Noise and Perkins yard in Castine. Uh, 
we have only uh, this sort of fuzzy half tone uh, because it's copied out of a book that was printed in 1932. The original picture, if it still exists, uh, is, is hidden away somewhere. No one knows. Um, several organizations on the main coast are looking for this image. Um, it was a, a daguerreotype originally. Um, it may not have been much better than, than this print. Um, one interesting thing, you can't see much detail here, but one interesting thing it does show is that this shipyard had no derricks. Uh, derricks would not be used uh, in shipyards anywhere, uh, in, in commercial shipyards anywhere until uh, after the Civil War. Uh, so every timber in this vessel was hand carried into place. The masts uh, were generally raised with um, a temporary rig called the shear legs, um, a, a, an A-frame uh, made from pieces of spars that were going to be used in the rig of the vessel, um, generally. This is a better photograph, uh, the earliest uh, picture we have, photograph we have of the uh, Kittery Navy Yard with the Constitution, uh, then a fairly elderly vessel um, being converted into a school ship. She's been hauled out on the Marine Railway here. Uh, and again, you see there's no, no derricks, no cranes, uh, nothing like that, even in a, a big uh, Navy Yard like this. And uh, another uh, period uh, photo from about the same period, 1860, um, of a ship named the Alice Venard at the Giles Loring Yard in Yarmouth. Um, you drive through this yard on Route 295 every time you go through Yarmouth. Um, the interesting thing here, well, two things. There's, first of all, no derricks again. Um, but the interesting thing that this picture shows uh, is that there's no launching ways. There's no ramp to carry that vessel down into the water. The picture's taken at low tide. It's going the high the water will be higher when the vessel's launched. Uh, and there's a little notch in the wharf there for the keel of the vessel to pass through. Uh, but by and large, it's just going to be uh, tipped off the wharf into the water. Uh, and it's a fairly decent sized vessel, 165 foot vessel. Uh, so not a tiny little thing. The peak of wooden shipbuilding uh, nationally, as well as in Maine, uh, happened in the 10 years following uh, the discovery of gold in California. Uh, and you see here, uh, the number of vessels built and the tonnage of vessels built uh, with Maine's total of the number of vessels built being uh, nearly 20% of the national total. Um, and the percentage of the tonnage uh, is larger. It's 30, fully 30% 30 of the national total. That means that the Maine is building larger vessels on average uh, than other places. <laughs> Good question. The, the man asks how large, uh, how large is a vessel? <laughs> uh, and uh, generally it's everything that's required to be documented by the federal government, which is five gross tons, or maybe five net tons, excuse me, five net tons. Uh, and that's a, a measure of capacity, not weight, uh, with each ton uh, being a uh, uh, 100 cubic feet. Hey, 
So compared to other states uh, in 1833, 1855, and 1890, um, you see Maine's uh, total of the tonnage is 32% uh, in 1833, which by the way, 1833 is the, the first year that we have reliable figures for all the states uh, so that the government started publishing in that year an annual report on navigation. Um, so 32% of tonnage uh, built in Maine in 33, 37% of the total national tonnage built in Maine in 1855. Um, in 1855, you'll notice uh, Maine built 396 vessels and New York built more than that. Uh, but New York's tonnage is way below Maine's tonnage. Uh, that's because New York in the 1850s is building uh, Erie Canal boats like crazy and they're not very big. Um, and then 1890, uh, Maine is still at the top um, at, at 23% of, of all American tonnage. Um, by the mid 90s, uh, that would be changing. Maine would no longer be uh, at the top. So that uh, Maine's dominance really is the, the years of the, of the 19th century. Um, this is the, the uh, shipbuilding uh, results uh, broken down by customs district uh, for one year, 55. Uh, and this is, um, these, these districts, many of them look like towns, but they're not really, that's just where the custom house was. The, that's the, the uh, port of entry. Uh, there's uh, quite a few towns actually included in every one. Um, you'll notice there's none that says Rockland. Um, in this period, uh, Rockland was part of the Waldeboro district. Waldeboro included everything from Damariscotta to Rockland uh, and, and actually to Rockport at one point, um, but Rockport was later split off into the Belfast district. Uh, anyway, it's... Um, the... Uh, there's a dozen districts or so, sometimes there's 13. It changes over time. Um, but this is one of the first things that the federal government did when it created itself in 1789 uh, was to establish customs districts all around the borders of the country uh, because for the first hundred years of our existence as a country, um, customs duties and fees were the, the major in, uh, source of income for the govern, government. Um, there were no taxes. Taxes were a bad idea at the time. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so um, Waldenboro was, uh, was the center of this district for some time. Uh, Rockland kind of became the tail that wagged the dog eventually. It was, um, and ultimately, a, uh, I think for a long time, there was a deputy collector stationed here in an office. Uh, in the 1870s, uh, this building was built here in Rockland to be the, uh, a custom house. And uh, all of the, Wal <coughs> excuse me, the Waldeboro uh, district records were brought here and stored in this building um, before. Um, being ultimately transferred to the National Archives. The, the structure, look, <clears throat> yeah. Um, it, the, it looks a lot like this building. I mean, the, the way that the, the stones around the, the base of this building are made uh, is very similar to the, to the old custom house. <clears throat> and the, the Rockland Shipbuilding Statistics, uh, the Historical Society here has published a wonderful book 
um, called the main beam uh, about um, about Rockland's uh, shipbuilding history in particular, um, and uh, they have listed 410 um, vessels built here uh, from the 1790s uh, to the early years of this century. Uh, 216 schooners, uh, 45 barks and barkentines, 44 brigs, 39 full rigged ships, 15 sloops, set three catches, and 48 powered vessels, 410 total, um, which is uh, compares pretty well with uh, the town of Walderboro itself. Although nobody has done as good a job of enumerating all of the Walderboro built vessels uh, as uh, you guys have done here in Rockland. <clears throat> Rigs are small uh, square rig vessels of two masts. Um, they were very popular in Maine. Uh, I being ideally suited uh, to coasting trades and to the West Indies trade. <clears throat> uh, in fact, Maine dominated uh, the construction of this rig. Uh, in 1847, in one year, uh, Maine built 120 brigs. Um, Maine just built more brigs. In fact, the majority of brigs uh, built in the entire country something like 70% year by year. Maine also built uh, the most full rigged ships. Uh, that's vessels of three or more masts, all of which are square rigged. Um, and then in the, in the statistics, they're linked with barks, uh, which are like ships, but they have one uh, fore and aft rig mast, uh, and barkentines, which have only one square rig mast. Um, in any case, uh, we're building through the, the last 30 years of the, the 19th century, we're building 70% of this rig or these rigs also. Schooners have always been a significant part of Maine's vessel production. Uh, and as schooners got bigger, more masts were added. Uh, and uh, the multi-masted schooners uh, were built in e ever increasing numbers in Maine. Um, Four-masted schooners, for example, uh, the first one was built in Bath uh, in 1879, 1880. Uh, altogether, 459 four-mast schooners were built in uh, on the East Coast, uh, and Maine built 326, so 70, 71 percent again. Walderboro uh, calls itself uh, frequently the home of the five-mast schooner. And that's because uh, they built the first one, the first one on the East Coast anyway. There was an earlier one in the Great Lakes. Um, but this is the, the Governor Ames uh, built at Walderboro uh, at the Levitt Storer Yard in 1888. Um, and 55 other five-mast schooners were built on the East Coast, 95% of them in Maine. Uh, more five masters were built in Bath. 28 were built in Bath, more than any town anywhere. This the a five master by this time. Um, this is a 245 foot vessel. Uh, the general uh, rule of thumb for the schooners uh, is two men per mast two men per mast, so 10 for a five master. And that includes captain, mates, cook, everybody. Uh, 
Uh, no, 10, 10 is the total for the for the whole vessel. If they were lucky, they'd hire, you know, a, a hire a kid to, to be a steward, a cabin boy kind of thing to make things a little easier for them. But but uh, that's the that's the advantage of a fore and aft rig. It's easier uh, to handle, um, cheaper to build in the first place, cheaper to maintain, and cheaper to crew. Fore and aft means uh, the sails are attached to the, the mast with rings slide up and down the mast, and they have a boom at the bottom, and usually they have a gaff at the top. Um, so, the, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction here. the sails here. That's the fore and aft sail. The, the, um, the masts are made up in two pieces. You have a lower mast and a top mast. These are square rig masts. The sails are attached to the yards and they hang down from the yards. And the Mast is made up of three pieces, lower mast, top mast, the gallon mast. Makes it, the, that makes the, the square rig mast uh, more expensive to build. It's got a lot more parts, a lot more rigging, uh, all those yards, uh, there's, there's, I don't know, 12 lines at least to control a, a, a square sail. Um, it's far fewer with a fore and aft sail. So, and, and a lot more crew, right? Somebody has to go aloft to handle these sails. The big sails on a schooner can all be handled from a deck. You have to go aloft to deal with the topsails, um, but the lower sails are, are from the deck. Okay, six mast schooners. Uh, the George Wells uh, was the first six-mast schooner, period, um, designed by John J. Wardwell, uh, built at the Holly Bean Yard in Camden in 1900. Uh, of the 10 six-mast schooners built on the East Coast, uh, nine were built in main shipyards, and seven of those nine were built in a single yard, the, the Percy and Small Yard in Bath. Um, Here in Rockland, uh, there was one of the other two uh, six masters uh, that was the, the Murdy B. Crowley. You have a, there's a, a diorama of her launching uh, in the library. Um, so this, is, this shows her uh, being framed out. She is hmm, 296 feet, yeah. Say again. Uh, I don't. I don't have the ability to relate it to the. Yeah. It's done in Camden, but then moved to Rockland. The hole and then well, no, no, no. Um, the, it hadn't gotten that far. Um, the uh, the bean yard was the yard that had built the first six master. Uh, they got the contract to build this one as well, um, but uh, something fell apart. I don't know if it was there was uh, some contract issue, uh, whether they were unable to perform in some way, uh, and so. The, the vessel hadn't gotten very far. Uh, I don't know to what extent it had been assembled, but it couldn't have been much. Uh, so they moved the keel and the frame pieces uh, here and started over. Group like this be owned by an individual or by like employees? Uh, never by an individual. 
in fact, almost no ships are owned by individuals. Uh, occasionally, that's that is the case with, say, a fishing vessel or something, a uh, small vessel. Uh, but by and large, a ship is an investment that can go away instantly, you know, one bad day, and that's all she wrote, and there's no recovery. Uh, so people tended not to put all their money, uh, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, so, yeah, people would buy shares. A big vessel like this uh, would be sold in 64ths. Uh, so one share would be a 64th of the, of the vessel's value. Um, and sometimes they'd split that in half. So half, yeah, they'd sell half shares. Um, so that'd be a hundred and, what's the 128th? <laughs> um, so that's how they financed the building up in Spain, is to go out and sell these shares in advance, come up with the funds, and then post the boat to a shipyard. Usually, sometimes things would get started in, on speculation. Uh, if, if uh, you know, the economy was good and everything, uh, you know, somebody had, a, a yard had an opportunity to, uh, to buy the frame of a vessel somewhere um, in pieces, I mean, uh, and uh, they might get started on something before they had owner for it. Uh, and sometimes things were built entirely on speculation. Uh, there's a, a well-known clipper ship that was built in South Portland, the, the Snow Squall. Um, that the piece of it was brought back in the in the 80s uh, from the Falkland Islands, um, and it's it's at the uh, Maine Maritime Museum now. Uh, but she was built on speculation, and they just sent it to Boston and sold it to the to the first person that came along with money in his in his pocket or uh, access to money, we'll say. Um, so noteworthy vessels, um, the Rappahannock, uh, at the time she was built in 1841 in Bath, uh, was the largest vessel that had yet been built in the United States. Um, she operated as an Atlantic packet immigrant ship and cotton freighter, taking record uh, cargoes of cotton to Europe and coming back with record numbers of hapless immigrants in the tween decks. Clippers, uh, clipper is a word that uh, people like to know and use. Um, a clipper is actually a vessel built for speed uh, at the expense of other considerations like uh, hull capacity, cargo capacity. Uh, and sometimes safety. Um, so this one, uh, the the uh, the red jacket built here in Rockland uh, in 1853, um, she holds a record across the Atlantic uh, that still stands for commercial vessels. Uh, so for a commercial sailing vessel, um, that that record still it today is 13 days, one hour and 25 minutes, New York to Liverpool. Um, the, the British uh, purchased her early on and used her in the uh, immigrant trade to Australia. So Maine built um, 80 or 90 vessels that were uh, reputed to be clippers. Uh, it's a, it's always a judgment call. Is a, is a vessel a clipper or not? Um, and uh, the the proof is in the pudding, as they say. If a vessel makes really fast passages, uh, then it must be a clipper. Um, Red Jacket definitely was. Uh, there were, uh, I believe, nine other vessels built in Rockland that have been called clippers at one time or another, um, and they are all the rigged like this as full rigged ships, three masts, square rigged on all three. Um, one of them was a bark, three masts, two square rigged masts and one fore and aft rigged mast. 
after the Clipper era, which uh, ends with the dying down of, uh, of the gold rush uh, trade to uh, California in the 1850s, um, and that spike in, uh, in shipbuilding production everywhere in the country, uh, after the Clippers are gone, um, every ship, every full rig ship called itself a Clipper. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we nowadays we try to make a distinction, uh, calling these ones the later ones down easters because they were almost all built in Maine, um, and uh, these are a couple of significant ones on the left. Uh, the Henry B. Hyde is is thought uh, has been claimed by some historians to be the the most. Uh, or I should say the, the best compromise between speed and cargo capacity. Um, so she was uh, considerably larger than, than most of the, uh, uh, of the earlier clippers. And then the, on the right, the, the center picture and the right-hand picture is the ship Arian uh, built in Pittsburgh in 1893. Uh, she was the last of these, the last wooden full rig ship built for commercial purposes in the United States and probably in the world. I don't just um, the the uh, countries that were still uh, building full rig ships uh, and using them uh, were building them out of iron and steel uh, by the 1890s. This uh, vessel novelty is the, the first steam vessel built for the offshore fisheries uh, of New England, uh, built in 1885 at Kennebunkport. This uh, vessel is a four-mast bark, um, the Roanoke, the largest wooden square rigger uh, <clears throat> to go to sea uh, under the American flag built uh, by Arthur Sewell and Company uh, Shipyard in Bath in 1892. Main shipyards tended to focus on sailing vessels more than steamers, but there were some steamers built in, in Maine and one yard uh, in Brewer, the, the barber yard uh, specialized in steamers. They built more than 30 of them uh, from 1875 to 1902. Um, mostly these little screw steamers, uh, propeller-driven steamers uh, for river at, or coastal work. A lot of them worked uh, in, in Penobscot Bay and Penobscot River. It, it kind of goes without saying that a lot of the uh, shipyards in Maine were building fishing schooners, uh, sloops and schooners uh, for fishing. Um, some towns were especially known for this, uh, including East Booth Bay and Castine and South Bristol. Um, and starting in 1873, uh, some yards also built fishing steamers for the inshore fisheries, uh, especially for the, the Menhaden or the Pogi. Uh, pogey fishing. Some of the uh, yards in Maine uh, built for the well-known fishing ports of other states. A lot of uh, Gloucester men, for example, Gloucester fishing schooners uh, were built here in, uh, in various places in Maine. By the mid 1800s, uh, many, some main shipbuilding timber was coming from out of state, uh, states to the south of us. Uh, this, was, uh, this was true uh, in the years immediately preceding the Civil War, for example. Uh, and by the early 1900s, a lot of stuff was coming uh, by ship and by rail uh, for. Uh, building vessels along the coast of Maine. You see on the left, these masts coming from the West Coast. Uh, these are um, Douglas fir, what, what they called Oregon pine. Um, 120 foot sticks over three 40 foot flat cars. 
and uh, a couple thousand uh, ship knees, another uh, ship timber, hull timber, um, coming by railroad. These are being prepared for shipment by railroad uh, from New Brunswick to Bath. Yeah. Um, th it's very carefully, uh, the, the route was plotted across the entire country to make sure that that could happen. Um, the, the, uh, the, yard, the, the masts do not touch the center car. There, there's, a, there's a pivot point here and then a pivot point at the other end. Any idea what a of that would weigh? Uh, I can think of a place to look, but I don't have that number on the top of my head. Sorry. Thinking of taking that across the Rockies, what it would take to haul that is a different Yeah. Yep. You know, those are those are the size you need for a six mast schooner. In that 1908, there was a six mast schooner being built in Bath. This is one of the shots from Rockland, uh, another Cobb Butler yard uh, um, shot of a couple of guys uh, high on the staging on the outside of the hull. Um, boring and driving fastenings uh, in a plank. The plank is held by the by a clamps um, where it goes. And an another uh, incarnation of that same shipyard is the Francis Cobb Company um, in uh, 1917 with three schooners under construction, uh, just starting to frame it out on the left and uh, one completely framed out in the middle and one uh, being painted on the, on the right. And uh, this is sort of an odd duck, uh, a, uh, a schooner hull that has been made into a steamer uh, another Wardwell design um, built for the Great Northern Paper Company um, and, and not particularly successful. Um, a lot of space, a lot of what should be uh, usable space is taken up by engines and boilers and fuel and uh, she required a crew of 30. Um, so a, a, a very modern vessel in some regards had had a refrigerator and things like that, but um, not uh, not easy to uh, to make money with. So steel shipyards uh, typically originate from foundries and engine builders and boiler makers, people that know how to work with metal. Uh, Maine's first steel shipyard was Bath Ironworks, uh, which began life as a foundry. Uh, they got their first contract uh, to build a steel vessel in 1890 from the U.S. Navy, uh, never having built a vessel of any kind previously. Uh, they, uh, they went on to build vessels of, of many different kinds, uh, and of course, they're still in business today. Um, the second steel yard uh, was Arthur Sewell and Company, which was one of those rare operations that actually made the switch from wooden shipbuilding to steel shipbuilding, which meant essentially rebuilding their whole plant and buying all the tools they needed and getting rid of their old employees and hiring new employees who, uh, who knew how to work with metal. The, the first vessel that ir the ironworks built was the Machias, uh, a gunboat for the Navy. Um, and the, the first vessel that the Sewells built, uh, which was completed a year later, uh, was the four-mast bark Dirigo, which also was the first 
steel sailing vessel built in the country. Uh, there had been earlier iron hulls, but not, not uh, steel ones. Uh, in this, in the, the World War I uh, uh, kind of turned things around for a, a, a brief time in the shipbuilding industry. Um, the uh, wooden shipbuilding industry had been kind of dying out uh, around the turn of the century. And then suddenly, uh, with the outbreak of war in, in Europe in 1914, um, there were contracts out there for vessels. People wanted ships. We were neutral for the first three years of the war and could trade uh, relatively freely. Um, so um, shipyards everywhere in Maine kind of got a, a rebirth uh, and new, new yards were created like this uh, Fry Flynn and Company uh, in Washington County. In, uh, in Portland, uh, several yards around Casco Bay got contracts uh, from the United States Shipping Board's Emergency Fleet Corporation, uh, which was building or trying to build um, big wooden freighters to a standard design, kind of the World War I version of the Liberty ship that came in World War II. Um, so a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these big steamers were built um, in, uh, in the uh, Portland area, generally too late because the United States was only in the war for a year um, and uh, uh, shipbuilding takes a while to organize. A second steel yard was started in Bath, the Texas Steamship Company, uh, which is a, a uh, division of Texas Oil Company. Um, they had uh, 3000 employees at one point. Um, they were a bigger operation than Bath Ironworks at the time, built 35 vessels uh, in the five years they were in operation. The Navy Yard in Portsmouth uh, that had been established in 1800, we saw the launching uh, in 1814 from it. Um, the, uh, uh, the yard was used for uh, repairs and maintenance, as well as, as building new vessels. Uh, but they, they ramped up shipbuilding enormously there during the Civil War. They built uh, 18 vessels, which was a lot for the time uh, during this, the Civil War, including uh, their most famous vessel of that time, uh, the USS Kearsarge, uh, which is a, a, a steam uh, sloop, steam sloop of war. Um, that uh, became famous for sinking the Alabama, the Confederate vessel Alabama off the coast of France. In uh, the early 20th century, uh, the Kittery Yard also became a steel shipyard, uh, building their first submarine uh, just in time for World War I. Uh, this is L-8. Um, they weren't, you know, they're boats, they're not ships, so they don't get names, <laughs> or they didn't used to get names. Um, L8 was it. Um, and they went on to build uh, a, a lot of, a lot of submarines, um, and grew quite a bit during the uh, Second World War. Uh, they went from fewer than 4,000 employees before the war um, to 20,000, more than 20,000 people, uh, civilian employees in 1943. Uh, they built 79 subs in the, the four years that the US was in that war, um, almost five years. Um, and this one uh, that the, the lady is christening in this photograph, um, received two battle stars for its uh, its um, activity in World War II uh, and was used in the 1950s while it was still in commission. Uh, it was used in movies. It was used in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Walt Disney. 
uh, and it was used in the, the classic World War II submarine movie, Run Silent, Run Deep. The Albacore uh, is a, a vessel that they built in, uh, what was it, 1953, I think. Yes, 53. Um, that was an experimental vessel, an unarmed vessel built to experiment with uh, different technologies like the shape of the hull and, uh, and uh, various other things. Uh, and she was quite successful. She was decommissioned in 1972 and she's a museum ship now. You can visit her in, in Portsmouth. It's also a museum in the Navy Yard, but you can't really get in the Navy Yard unless you have business there. So it's usually closed. Um, after building the Albacore, they went on to build uh, 10 uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, the Navy likes to keep the, its nuclear business uh, in-house. Uh, and so they uh, built, 10 nuclear submarines there. And this is the last one. In fact, the last vessel that they have built new uh, at Kittery, uh, the Sandlands. Um, and ever since that time, in 1969, uh, they are, uh, they've been working at repair and refit and reconditioning and so forth. BIW specialized in a different uh, vessel type the, the, for the Navy, uh, the destroyer. So they, they built a number of destroyers uh, in the World War I period. And by World War II, um, they were doing their best to outproduce everybody. Um, it's a small yard physically, it's hemmed in by uh, well, there's, there's a, the bridge across the river on one side and, and residential neighborhoods all the way around. Um, uh, but they, they set up uh, eight uh, building slips in the yard. And you can see that uh, a number of vessels uh, being outfitted at the wharves alongside. Uh, so they employed uh, at the peak of the war, uh, 12,000 people, which is more people than live in the city of Bath. Um, and uh, they, by the, by the end of 1942, uh, they were delivering most months two destroyers. Uh, it, it averaged out to be uh, a, a destroyer every 17 days from um, the end of 1942 or beginning of 43 uh, to, the, to 1945. During the Second War, um, shipyards everywhere in Maine got contracts of, from one government agency or another. Uh, a batch of minesweepers were built here, 10 minesweepers uh, built in the snow yards here in, in uh, Rockland. Um, and and uh, they built uh, oh, another, another dozen or 15 uh, vessels of other types as well. And other yards doing the same sort of thing <clears throat> in uh, in Damascata and Camden and Booth Bay Harbor and Freeport and so forth. South Portland was a, a big uh, big story during the war. There were um, two large shipyards there. Uh, one was established initially. Uh, to build ocean-class vessels for the British while the U.S. was still neutral. Uh, and uh, they built 30 of the ocean-class vessels. Uh, and then they went on to build Liberty ships uh, after the U.S. got in the war. And, uh, and the other shipyard was created to, to expand the, the Liberty ship construction as well. Uh, so 244 Liberty ships in South Portland uh, as well as the 30 ocean class. There's 
one of the uh, liberties being launched there. In the 20th century, uh, after the war, uh, some of the uh, some of the other smaller yards switched to steel. Um, we had the uh, Gowdy and Stevens that that built wooden yachts, uh, so built a number of uh, of steel vessels in the 60s, and Harvey Gamage in the uh, in South Bristol built steel vessels while his really his son uh, was building steel vessels uh, in the 70s. Noteworthy 20th century vessels include uh, Roosevelt uh, that uh, Robert Perry took to uh, the Arctic uh, a number of times, including the time that he uh, made his claim to be the first to the North Pole. Um, she was built in Verona Island um, by the McKay and Dix Yard in 1905. The last six master uh, was built in Bath at Percy and Small that, that built also six other um, six masters. Um, she was the, the largest, the largest, probably the largest wooden sailing vessel used in the US. Another Arctic uh, vessel uh, was built for Donald McMillan uh, by Hodgson Brothers in East Booth Bay. Uh, McMillan and Peary were both Bowdoin graduates. So that's part of the main connection, as well as the vessels being built in Maine. Uh, and there's a museum there in, in, in Bowdoin uh, that's devoted to their uh, polar activities. It's quite a few uh, yachts built at BIW. Uh, I'll mention uh, just the one, the Aris, uh, ordered uh, 11 days before the 1929 stock market crash uh, and delivered uh, in 1931 and paid for, thank you very much, in, uh, in 1931. Um, so that her, her owner was not particularly destroyed by the, by the crash, uh, but her importance comes a bit later. In World War II, she was taken by the Navy as a patrol craft, uh, and after the war uh, was put back in yacht condition and was used as a presidential yacht. Harry Truman uh, loved her evidently uh, and um, Eisenhower did not. Eisenhower used her once uh, and she was, she kicked around for years after she was, she just sank a few years ago in, uh, in uh, Italy somewhere. Lots of people had ideas of restoring her and it just never happened. Um, this was the, the uh, BIW's successful defender of the America's Cup, uh, Ranger, uh, built in 1937. She cost $164,000, almost exactly what the six-mass schooner Wyoming had cost in 1909. She, she's steel, of course, and uh, aluminum uh, spars. And there's lots of stories from World War II about BIW destroyers. Uh, I will mention one only. Uh, this is Laffey uh, that was a picket vessel during the invasion of Okinawa uh, in April of 1945. Uh, she was hit by seven kamikaze planes, five of them carrying bombs, and by four bombs dropped by other aircraft in an 80 minute period. So an hour and a half, give or take. Um, she was very badly damaged, but did not sink and was repaired. And today is another vessel you can visit. Uh, she's in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina uh, as a museum.
and this is, uh, I have to mention this one, uh, Maui uh, built for the protected trade between California and Hawaii, uh, uh, run by the Matson line, uh, built at BIW in 1978. I saw her launch during a snowstorm uh, and uh, 720 feet, 24,000 and a half gross tons. Uh, she's the largest vessel built in the state of Maine so far. And another Rockland uh, story, some of these characters, uh, I know at least one of you knows uh, Captain John Foss and Captains Doug and Linda Lee. Uh, at the, their, uh, their North End yard, they built their own schooner heritage, uh, launched in 1983, and the picture shows it sailing in 1984. Um, one of the more uh, recent, if not the newest, uh, actually, uh, vessel built for the windjammer trade. Washburn and Dowdy uh, is a East Booth Bay yard that got start started uh, in uh, Woolwich. Um, very uh, big in the tugboat construction business uh, for tugboat uh, operators around the country. And Newburton Wallace and Thomaston, I think, uh, built the last commercial wooden vessel. Uh, in Maine, and this is this is it. The Columbia uh, completed in 1985. BIW uh, modernized in the 1970s uh, and took on the construction of the lead ship of the Oliver Hazard Perry class of guided missile frigates, uh, and they uh, built this one. Uh, on time and under budget, supposedly, and um, then uh, 23 others uh, of the same class. And they modernized again in 2001. Since 2001, no vessel at BIW has been launched down inclined ways into the water. Uh, they built themselves a, a, a flat facility. Uh, everything is built on the land, on, on the level now, which is much easier and more productive. Um, and they have this floating dry dock that they can, uh, they can drive the vessels into the dry dock on these wheeled units. Uh, and then the dry dock gets cranked into uh, the middle of the river where there's a hole that they've dredged and they can just sink the dry dock and, and the vessel floats off. So it's not nearly as thrilling to watch, uh, but uh, they, I'm sure, had their reasons. So the new facility enabled them uh, to uh, continue work on on some um, unusual craft, uh, they, they launched their first uh, or delivered their first um, Arleigh Burke class vessel, again, the lead ship of the class uh, in 1990, and were um, eventually thought they were going to move into uh, building the Zumwalt class, uh, the DDG 1000 class, um, but the uh, the Navy hasn't um, hasn't ordered any more from anybody. Um, this sort of that design is sort of under a cloud, not because of something that shipyard did, but because of the design itself. Um, and uh, they've gone back to. Uh, the guided missile destroyers, uh, I mean, excuse me, the Arleigh Burke class of destroyers, uh, which are smaller and um, larger crews, though. Um, just those three. 
Yeah. And the last one was at the yard for years. Um, yeah. Smaller yards uh, throughout Maine continued to build fishing vessels, especially lobster boats uh, and pleasure boats and occasionally other types, um, generally calling themselves boat yards rather than shipyards. Uh, but a lot of them are building vessels uh, larger than 40, even 50 feet now. Um, and so they would require federal registration or documentation. One of those uh, great things uh, is this, this racing yacht, Comanche. Um, you remember that the Rockland built Clipper Red Jacket had the record, still has the record for crossing the Atlantic never equaled by a commercial sailing vessel. Well, it has been equaled and bettered uh, by yachts of various kinds, uh, at, including catamarans, uh, so multi-hulled vessels. Uh, this vessel um, now has, I believe still has, uh, the west to east transatlantic record for a monohull non-commercial. Um, and her record, remember the, the Red Jacket's record is 13 days and, and change. Uh, Comanche's record uh, is five days, 14 hours, 21 minutes, and 25 seconds. The interesting thing is that she broke the previous record by more than a day. They're keeping track of the seconds, but she breaks the record by a day and some hours. Um, so it's not like you know, uh, an Olympic event where the, the runner beats the world record by a tenth of a second. Uh, it's it's a, a serious uh, change in, in design. So it's a it's a hundred foot carbon fiber sloop uh, built by Hodgson Yachts in East Booth Bay. Uh, they built the largest marine oven in the country, big enough to hold the entire vessel in order to cure uh, the uh, the carbon fiber in the hull. Yeah. There are videos out on the yes. of it. Please, it's just amazing. You cannot imagine the sustaining ship going to succeed the sail of them. Right, right. There's, there's some amazing uh, video of, of her racing. Uh, oh, I don't know. It looks like 20 or so. <laughs> See them. Yeah. I'm going to guess 20, but I don't really know. Um, and this is the last slide. Um, in October of 2019, uh, as I was finishing up this book, uh, the University of Maine announced the receipt of three Guinness World Records. Uh, the world's largest prototype polymer 3D printer, the world's largest 3D printed object, and the world's largest 3D printed boat. And that's the, the boat and I believe the object as well. Uh, and behind it is the, is the printer. Um, so it's a 5,000 pound boat, 25 foot boat. Uh, so a little on the heavy side, uh, and uh, it, it doesn't really qualify as shipbuilding, uh, but the printer is designed to print objects up to 100 feet long. Uh, so maybe this is the, uh, the, the way of the future. Um, and the, the uh, Composites Center at UMaine uh, has been working uh, to develop the use of bio-based thermoplastics. Uh, so they want to develop something um, that can that combines plastic and wood fiber uh, with 50% wood products in the material uh, that will print at 500 pounds per hour. Uh, so it sounds exciting <laughs> in a way. Uh, hmm? Well, yeah. Um, but, well, anyway, um, uh, so 
you know, history doesn't, doesn't, uh, a history professor once told me history doesn't make right angle turns. Uh, things are not going to change completely overnight. Uh, but uh, this, this might be uh, the way of the future. In any case, uh, you know, somebody from 200 years ago, when Maine was made, made into a state, uh, would barely recognize a shipyard of today. And I would assume that the same would be true of us uh, 200 years in the future. Thank you.